The first thing that pros do that you don't is turning on your team color to red and your opposing team color to either blue or orange. Now this was actually coined by Fox A, who is a pro league player and a YouTuber. Where in this video... Have you ever played a rank game and you just feel like every death is to someone you can't see? And the main point of what he was trying to say in that video is that if you put a claymore down just like this, the laser from the claymore and the color of that laser will change depending on what side you're on. Now, as you can see, the red outline right here actually really blends in with the red staircase. So if you're a defender, that's pretty hard to see if you're not looking for it. But because I'm on attack, I don't actually see it, but I don't really have to see it. It's my claymore. Due to the fact though that I put my opposing team color on blue, that claymore line would appear to be bright blue, which stands out a lot on a bright red surface. As you can see, that is much easier to see on that red surface than the red line was, which is why as a defender, you want to have your opposing team color on blue and your team color on red. Same thing for attackers, it's just much easier to see utility that way. Now that was just one out of 10 different things that pros do that you don't. The second of which being that you don't take space properly with Lion or Ying. Now, Ying and Lion are two operators of the same coin. They do essentially the same job, just a bit differently. Ying has candelas that she can throw down, and whenever you throw a candela at a defender, they're typically going to run away or be blinded in which the time you can use to take the space that they were in, which gives you free space. She also has four of these candelas, so you have four opportunities to create a push or take space that you otherwise couldn't have done without the Ying candela. It's the same thing for Lion. If you drone out a defender and then you Lion scan, they're going to be sitting still because they don't want to get pinged, so you'll know where they are and you can easily pre-fire them and kill them, which is great for taking space on the roam. Even if they do choose to run away, they'll get pinged, so you can still kill them or you'll know where they are and because they ran away, you can take their space for absolutely free. So Lion and Ying are meant to actually take space and not necessarily get kills. But this isn't just subject to Lion and Ying. Learning how to take space in general is something that is very important for Siege players that pros do efficiently and a lot of people, especially even in champ rank, don't do at all. Let's take roaming for example. The entire point of roaming isn't actually to get kills, but it's to hold space and waste time. Let's say that you're roaming the top floor for a bottom floor site. Your job isn't to get a bunch of kills on the top floor. Your job is to hold the top floor so they don't get the top floor and start playing vert for the site. You do this by wasting as much time as possible, so they have as little time to use their utility on the floor as possible. You also do this by holding space for as long as possible, so they don't get that space to use to buck open the floor, or ram open the floor, or sledge open the floor, whatever it may be. So holding space is crucial on the defense, which in turn obviously also means that taking space is also crucial. So you need to make sure that you're using operators like Ying, like Lion, like Dokebi, like Jackal, to get space and take control of space so that you can easily win rounds and use utility that you wouldn't have been able to use had you not taken the space in front of you. But how else can you take space unless you're aggressive when taking the space? Well, this brings me into my third tip. Pros are excellent at learning when to use aggression and when not to use aggression, and I guarantee you, you aren't. Now, I've talked about on this channel a golden rule of thumb being that when you are down in man count, you need to be aggressive, and when you're up in man count, you need to be passive. Now, for a solo queue environment, this is usually true. Nine times out of ten, this is going to be a great golden rule, but the higher ranks that you get in and the less solo queue you are, the more complicated this becomes. For example, if you are up in man count, but you're on attack, how are you not supposed to be aggressive when you have to literally attack the defenders? It doesn't make sense, right? Or how about whenever you're actually even on man count? What are you supposed to do? Be aggressive or be passive? Because that's a little third in between place. So like I said, there's certain exceptions and the more you look into that golden rule, it just gets a bit more complicated. So I'll lay out everything for you right now. First, starting out with the defense. If you ever get kills and you are up in man count, you want to play passive. The reason for this being is because the attackers naturally have to come to you. They have to kill you or they have to get the bomb down, so wasting time for them so they can't do that is going to be the best bet. Attackers only have around 3 minutes to do what they need to do, so if you can waste as much time as possible so they can't do that, that's going to be within your best interest. Now, if you are down in man count on defense, then you actually want to be being aggressive. This is due to the fact that if you don't do that, attackers will swarm the bomb site. They'll have three people funnel into one doorway, and I don't know if you've ever played the game before, but you can't really shoot three people at once unless they're right next to each other. 
Not only that, but they'll have teammates coming from behind you, coming from the side of you, holding angles from a window that you didn't even know existed, playing vert from below you. You'll just get swarmed. So on defense, if you're down in man count, you have to take 1v1s as much as possible and be aggressive to even that man count back out. So if you're in a 3v5, be aggressive until it's a 3v3. Once you've evened out the man count though, then start to play passive. Because you just killed a few of their teammates, they're gonna notice, hey, they're being aggressive, and they're gonna start to bait and wait for you to be aggressive and then kill you. So once you've gotten those initial kills and you've evened out the man count a little bit, then start to play passive. Start to hold a little bit of off angles, passive angles, if you will. Maybe don't swing people as much, wait for them to drone, do what you need to do, but start to slow down the aggression once you've evened out the man count. Now that we've talked about defense, let's talk about attack. What pro players typically do is within the first 30 seconds to minute of the round, they'll be very aggressive. This is where they'll open hatches on roof. They'll get walls open. They'll start droning. They'll start sending people in after drones. They'll start getting initial entry picks. Then once that first 30 seconds to a minute has gone by, they'll start to slow down. They'll start to drone out. They'll start to use a bit more utility that's a bit slow. They'll start to give comms. They'll start to reposition themselves to get into a better position for the late round plant. Once you've done that slow initial rush, maybe you're up in man count so you don't need to be as aggressive then what you'll do is you'll start to take space that is near or even on the site using smoke grenades to do this running in the wall trying to get a plant down being a little bit more aggressive with the kills maybe getting off a vert and rotating the site whatever you need to do this is where you start to be a bit more aggressive and finalize the attacking round and then the post plant once the post plant has gone by pretty much every single rule that i talked about for defense applies just think of yourself as a defender whenever you have the bomb down because the defenders have to come to you, so you might as well be. Now, in terms of what you do when there's certain man count, well, the same rules really apply. If you're up in man count on attack, you really want to be slowing down, starting to drone things out, using utility, taking key positions. You don't want to be getting aggressive and letting them refrag you and getting the man count back to even. If you're down in man count, especially later in the round you want to be getting very aggressive because this will make it to where defenders won't start running out on you swarming you spawn peeking you and just making you take a bunch of gunfights that you can't handle all at once but that's pretty much every single scenario that i can give you for when to be aggressive and when to be passive another thing that pros do really well that i guarantee you don't do at all is holding unorthodox angles to show you this i brought you onto clubhouse where i'll be attacking with ram now, as RAM, people will typically shove a RAM drone through this door and then activate it to create a vert all along the hallway when they're attacking the basement. The issue with this is that a lot of defenders will come from down main stairs or up main stairs, from bathroom or from the bar double door to contest you when you're trying to play vert, or even flank your teammates who are in kitchen. This being said, that means a lot of RAM players will sit and hold the door like this, or they'll sit inside of kitchen and try to hold the door like this and kill people. This is terrible. Defenders will punish you a lot for doing this, so what Pro League has done is they've adapted by repelling on what's known as chain repel. Chain repel is much easier to do and much safer, because you can shoot through these chains pretty easily and kill people, whereas it's a lot harder for them to shoot you through the chains because the metal is right on your face. It's also farther away, harder to see you from, and just less expected, so it's a much better angle. I, for one, have adopted this in my ranked games, and I've been telling a lot of y'all to do the same thing, and it works out a ton. And that's just one example of how holding off angles can really help you. If you want to still hold main stairs for a potential flank, there's a multitude of different off angles you can use. There's that off angle. If you push strip club instead of that door, you can hold the angle here, which a lot of defenders won't expect. You can even get on this hatch right here. Then you can prone on the hatch and through this little sliver right here through the doorway, you can see the bottom of main stairs right there. As you can see, those were my bullets. So like there's plenty of off angles you can use and utilizing them is very powerful because no one's going to expect them that you'll get a lot of free kills. And I see pros using all of these angles a ton. That's actually where I got the angles in the first place. The same can even be said for defense though, let's pretend that I'm defending basement right now. The entire reason that people put feet holes on this wall is because it was an unorthodox angle back in the day to hold through these feet holes to hold the bottom of main stairs. Now it's much more commonplace, but still it's a really nice off angle that can catch new players off by surprise. If you want one that's super unknown though, pretend that this wall is reinforced and you have a rotate on this wall right here, which is typically pretty common. 
A lot of attackers who push down blue stairs will expect you to be behind generator and on the rotate. So you can kind of throw them for a loop and put a hole next to this reinforcement here. And then now you have a long angle onto anybody on these secret stairs, which is super powerful. And just this off angle alone, nobody really expects and can get you a lot of free kills and win you a lot of games. So utilizing weird and unorthodox angles is something that pros do that you need to start doing. Speaking of angles though, the next thing that pros do that you don't is holding longer angles. The average gunfight distance for most players in ranked is 6 to 8 meters, depending on the map that you're on. But the average gunfight distance for pro players is actually 10 to 12 meters. Now this might seem like a very slight difference, but as you can see, this angle here, holding the doorway, is 6 to 8 meters. Whereas this angle here is 10 to 12 meters, and... Obviously, this angle is much tighter and much better to use for gunfights, which is why this is such an important tip. Holding longer angles can make an angle much better and much easier for you to get a gunfight with. Not only is the example I showed you that much prominent and that much of a better angle, but you can even back it up further and sit behind dorms and hold the exact same angle and make it much harder for them to shoot you. Not only does holding longer angles make it harder for them to see you, but it also makes it to where you're smaller on their screen. And basic physics shows us that things that are moving the same rate look faster if the thing that is moving is smaller than the thing that is bigger. That's why giants that are moving 20 miles an hour in TV movies look so slow, even though they're going so fast. So the smaller you are on an enemy's screen, the faster you're going to appear to move, which makes you even harder to hit. Not only this, but if people have low settings, which most people do, then farther away objects are actually going to be even harder to see, so holding longer angles is much better for you as a player. Something else that is much better for you as a player is properly utilizing your drones. Now, I'm not just going to say you need to be droning yourself in or you need to be droning more. That's a pretty basic tip that everybody gives on YouTube channels. What I want to talk about specifically is droning in your teammates or making sure that your teammates are droning you in. As an entry player or as 90% of the player base nowadays, you want to make sure that you're getting droned in by your support players. It's very important because it allows you to have information that you can act off of instead of just quick peeking everything, which one is much more dangerous, but two wastes a lot more time. Not only is getting droned in super important, but more importantly, you need to be utilizing cutoff drones in the prep phase. Too often am I seeing my teammates just not droning in the prep phase and just scrolling on TikTok instead. You don't really want to be doing this. I mean, come on. Why are you queuing ranked if you're not going to take it seriously at least a little bit? Instead, you want to be finding places that you can use cutoff drones on. Cutoff drones are essentially drones that you use in the prep phase to make sure that nobody is in a certain room so that you can get in that room the second the prep phase ends. For example, people will typically drone through this drone hole right here and set a drone exactly where I'm proning right now. This drone makes it to where if anybody tries to go into small tower, this drone will see it. But if nobody crosses this drone right here before the prep phase ends, then you as an attacker know for a fact that nobody is top small tower, nobody's bottom small tower, nobody's in shower hall, nobody's in shower, and you know that nobody is inside of dining. That is like a third of the entire map that you just cleared instantly in a matter of a few seconds just because you had a drone here. That saves so much time, it's ridiculous. And if you need to redrone it, you always can. So the amount of time that that just saved you is really, really good. But it also serves as a flank cam that you can use later if you need to do that. So having cutoff drones in the prep phase that you can use just for yourself, much less your teammates, is such a powerful thing that every single pro player uses in their ranked games. So why would you not use it in yours? Something else that I see pro players doing a lot is sticking to just a few operators. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Siege is a strategy game where you have to use every single operator when the situation calls for it, and every single operator's situational. No, it's not. No, it hasn't been that game for three years, let's keep it real. There's a reason that everyone's playing Warden, everyone's playing Legion, everyone's playing Azami, everyone's playing Fenrir, everyone's playing Solus, because they're just good operators. You can bring Azami every single round, no one will complain, you will get free wins. You can bring Sledge every single round, no one will complain, you will get free wins and free kills. Obviously, you can't play Blackbeard every single round. But like, if you mained Ace and Sledge, no one's gonna complain. And if 
those are your highest win rate and KD operators, then you definitely should be doing that. It's as easy as downloading R6 Tracker and looking at your stats. It's it's really that easy. I, not, not even sponsored, by the way. You can just go to their website. It's the easiest thing to do in the world. But if you just look up your stats and you're like, oh, I have a 1.7 KD on Wamai, just start playing Wamai every single game. Every pro league player that I watch plays the same three operators every single event they ever play in. They play the same set of operators for every single team because they know that ace is going to be good every single site you bring him thatcher is going to be good every single site you bring him sure do they have a flex operator that switches it up from dokabi to lion to capitao to grim every once in a while sure but they do that because they have a strat in mind and they're a coordinated team you aren't you're a solo queue player and playing ace and Dizami every single round because they are your highest win rate operators is going to be absolutely fine and it's something you definitely should start doing because statistically you will win more and get more kills something else that is statistically just good right now is dmrs the 417 being one of the best in my opinion DMRs are highly underrated, and I think they started actually getting their usage once people realized how bad the F2 was after the recoil nerf, and they realized how good the 417 was. Once people realized how good the 417 was, and they realized how good Dokabi's DMR was after Dokabi became meta, that's two DMRs that everyone started playing. Then, once Pro League got a hold of this new semi-DMR meta, they started using DMRs a lot. And I mean a lot. People now use DMR on Lion in the Pro League scene more than they use his 308. People use the DMR on Sens in Pro League more than they use Sens' as POF9. People are even bringing Buck DMR over the C8. I mean, that's just crazy. But DMRs are starting to become very meta because DMRs are actually really good if you know how to use them. The way you properly use DMRs is by holding tight angles and just spraying people whenever you see them walk by. I know that seems a bit underwhelming, but hear me out. DMRs have every single scope in the game, minus obviously Glass Scopes and Kali Scope. As you can see on this DMR, I have the 2x scope, because DMRs bring that. They bring the ACOG, they bring the 1.5, whatever you want, DMRs have every scope in the game. So naturally, if you have longer scopes, you're able to take longer gunfights, which a lot of people don't have. So if you're able to take longer gunfights, you definitely want to be abusing such a rare power. If you're going to be taking longer gunfights, that means typically with DMRs, taking longer gunfights and holding longer angles is a great idea. But with DMRs specifically, it's a great idea. Because the name of the game with DMRs is they have low fire rate due to the fact that you have to actually press the button every time you want to shoot them, but they also have really, really high damage. This DMR in specific has over 60 damage per bullet, which can two tap three speeds. Now the thing about guns that do a lot of damage is that you naturally just want to be holding longer angles with them and tighter angles at that because it allows you to put multiple bullets and kill someone in such a tight angle, whereas an SMG will require like five or six bullets so you'd have to swing out more and put yourself at risk more, which is something that we'll talk about in a later tip, but you get the idea. DMRs are naturally just good at holding very tight and long angles, which is something that I see a lot of pros doing with DMRs specifically that you need to start doing as well. Speaking of different weapons changing your playstyle though, the next thing that pro players do that you don't is the fact that they play differently based off of what weapons they have. For example, right now I have Mozzie's P10 Roni, which as you can see in the bottom right corner has 16 bullets. This means with Mozzie that if I shoot one person, I have to reload right after pretty reliably after every single gunfight. Like, it's really bad. Which means as Mozzie, instead of just swinging and being extremely aggressive, you want to be actually being aggressive and then immediately backing off, which changes your playstyle. Not only this, but because of the fact that you have to do that, you want to be positioning differently. You don't want to be positioning out in the open, because if you do that and you have to reload, you're gonna die. So you want to be positioning yourself in places where you can easily peek somebody and then back off into cover. Whereas Ying, you don't really have to worry about that. With Ying, you can swing and keep swinging and fire and you know, provide suppressing fire, and write a book in the meantime while you're firing, because she has that much ammo, and then start a new life, maybe get a new wife, maybe get new kids, maybe start a new clothing brand, and then now it's your time to reload. 
So with Ying, as you can see, you can swing out a lot more, maybe get a more aggressive, maybe take more space, so it just makes sense to play differently with Ying. Or maybe like I said with DMRs, you can maybe hold longer angles, hold tighter angles, be a bit more passive to rack up damage and get kills for absolutely free, and maybe a bit safer. But you get the idea, the weapon that you're playing heavily dictates your playstyle and your positioning, and if you have any specific weapons in mind that you have questions on, let me know down in the comments. The final thing that pros do that you don't is they change their aggression and their playstyle based off of the map they're playing. Now that might sound pretty simple because duh, different map means you play different, but it goes a bit deeper than you think. Let's take Border for example. Border is a very, very tiny map. Because the map is so tiny, there's naturally just less rooms, which means as a defender, there's less rooms that you can hold. Because there's less rooms that you can hold, the attackers have a much easier time gaining control of the map, which means as a defender you need to aggressively hold map control much more which is why a lot of people hate playing on border because it's a much more aggressive map where people are just swinging more things and for good reason because on border you typically want to be being way more aggressive than on other maps because you have much less space that you have to hold and if the attackers take it from you it's a guaranteed match loss Let's take CC for example. A lot of players hate holding CC and they outright just give it to the attackers for free because it's so hard to hold. It's so hard to hold because you have a window there. You have a wall there typically with feet holes on it that they can shoot you from. You have a door there you have to worry about. You have a door there you have to worry about. They can play vert below you. You have a hole here. You have a hatch here they can go up if they're a Maru. You have a door there. You have a door here. If you make head holes here, you have an entire east balcony you have to worry about with a window here, a staircase here, a door here. You, you know, you have the 90 window here. You have the door here. There's just so much to worry about when you hold this spot, so a lot of people just don't even bother. But if you want to win on border, you have to change your playstyle and how you play. You gotta be more aggressive. You have to hold rooms you naturally wouldn't be able to hold. So, you know, put Nazami here to cover the window. Maybe castle barricade this doorway here to cover this door so that they don't shoot you whenever you're inside of security. Maybe get on this table and hold the angles onto here so that nobody gets on your east balcony. Maybe reinforce that wall so they can't shoot you whenever you're playing for this door. Or make a rotate here so you can get out safely. It doesn't matter, but just change your playstyle and be more aggressive when you're playing border. The complete opposite can be said for a huge map like Nighthaven Labs. Like I said earlier, if you're a defender, your goal is to waste time and hold space. But if there's a bunch of space like there is on Nighthaven Labs due to the fact that the map is just so big, then you don't necessarily have to worry about being so aggressive or holding rooms super aggressively. You can afford to lose a room or two because they have to clear like seven more to get to the bomb side, anyways. Let's take the basement for example. If they want to even think about playing, Playing vert on the basement, they have to clear the first floor. But if they want to clear the first floor, they have to clear the second floor. So that's already one more floor than border, which wastes a lot more time for the attackers. So if I'm Yana and I want to roam clear just one soulless out of, you know, roaming in the top floor to play the bottom floor, I have to get on my clone. When I get on my clone, I have to roam clear this room, all of the corners in this room, this hallway, the room here, the hallway here, the staircase here. I have to put flank watch here. Then I have to roam clear server, I have to roam clear IT, I have to roam clear rafters, I have to clear command center, I have to clear CC hallway, the staircase, all of garage, and that's just one floor. I still have an even bigger first floor that I have to clear, and that wastes so much time. So as a defender, because you're already wasting so much time, they already have so much space that they have to clear, you don't really need to play aggressive, you don't need to take gunfights. You can just see a drone once they drone you out, shoot the drone, and then leave that room and hold a different room. Once they drone you out, shoot the drone, leave and hold a different room. And by you just doing that like four or five times, you've wasted a minute and a half of their time, which by the way is half of the total time they have to execute on the bomb site. So like I said, just because you're on a bigger map you can play a lot more passively you can roam a lot heavily and it just makes it to where you play differently because you're on a different map so like i said pro players abuse this they play differently based off of the map that they're playing on and that's something that you should do in your ranked games but with it out of the way that's it for this video my name is alka check out this next video and i'll hope i'll see you there later